manly blue flowers. <laughs> the corner piece, corner piece like, like my daughter likes. <laughs> It is the corner piece. They thought it would be fun. Now, I am going to record just a little bit of what we're doing in order to do one of our new podcasts. So I have to start over again. Look, isn't that exciting? All right. So tonight um, is the book launch. It's January 9th, 2018. And we are, once again, launching a Brad Taylor thriller. Have we not actually... This is the 12th. I think we've launched at least 10 of them, haven't we? No, usually the uh, uh, you're the first stop we have a launch party in Charleston. This is the first time that we've actually launched from, actually the second time we've launched from here. Okay. All right. And so what do you do in Charleston you can't do in Scottsdale? Yeah. Well, we, that's my wife. She has a enormous party. Usually there's some part of Charleston that's in the book, and we usually go to that spot and have a launch party, uh, which is... is uh, much more of a party than it is a launch. <laughs> this time you could actually have like gone to Haifa or possibly Jerusalem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because Brad is exploring new territory. Now, because we're doing a bit of an exploratory thing, I cheated. And um, there was a wonderful interview that I found where Brad answered five questions about his books. And I thought some of his answers were fabulous. So... We'll see if you remember them. If not, I have a helpful sure. cheat sheet here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you didn't start out to be a writer. You were, in fact, in the military. Right. And you got your last actual assignment in the military before you turned down promotion was? I was an instructor at the city, teaching uh, military science. And so, like Robert B. Parker, who used teaching as an opportunity to write a novel, which he did, you did the same. Yeah, pretty much, exactly what I did. I, was, I left uh, Fort Bragg where I was deploying constantly. You're working 20 hours a day. Uh, and I started teaching, which is more of a 9 to 5 job. And I had a ton of time on my hands. You know, I, mean, I didn't know what to do myself. So I wrote a book. <laughs> well, the impression I had was that you had long thought about writing oh, a book. That was the goal. Yeah, it was definitely a bucket list item. It was something in the back of my head I was always going to do. Uh, I had no plans on being a... Uh, Maybe in a very small part of the back of my brain, you know, I'd fantasize about it, but I, being realistic, knew that you know, I was going to stay in the military, but I'm going to write this book. Um, I told my wife I'm going to write a book, and she was like, well, whatever, get on it. <laughs> and uh, I wrote it, and um, then it sold. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Trust me, no one's more surprised than me. Uh, and then the publisher asked if I could write a note. And then I came on the promotion list for Colonel, and my daughter was there in high school. My next assignment was two years on a company to Pakistan tribal area. Uh, I had a lot of competing interests, and I decided to retire to see if I could become a writer. Oh, so the timing was really very fortunate. Yeah, worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Military fiction seems the obvious choice for you, but is it because you loved it, or is it because you were doing that whole write what you never do? Uh, really, it was kind of, my One Rough Man, the first book, was a story, I wanted to write a story of redemption. And uh, if I had been a policeman, Pike would have been a cop. If I had been a priest, he'd have been taking confession. I was a special forces operator, so that's what he became. Um, but it wasn't a function of uh, this, the redemption theme is what I wanted to do. The backdrop was military thriller, and I, it's what I knew. So, I wrote it. so in this new book, your twelfth one, um, you were quoted here in this article saying, "I had three goals." Mm -hmm. Do I need to repeat them? Or do no, you remember I know. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. So yeah, I, I, this is the first book um, from a long time. I was doing two books a year. And uh, the pace was just crushing. I mean, just absolutely crushing. Uh, Ring of Fire, the last book I did when I was here the, uh, um, a year ago, I actually missed my deadline for the first time ever and uh, finished that up. And I told my publisher midway through that I've got you know, no mas. This is not, I can't keep this pace. Uh, I didn't have a life. I mean, I literally didn't. I was either overseas researching for a book, I was doing a security contract somewhere, uh, or I was writing. I had absolutely no downtime whatsoever. Um, which was fine, you know, for four books. At six books, I was like, okay, I'm done with this. It's killing me. And so I had a, a year to think about this. When I decided, that this was the first book where I sat down and to put a lot of thought into, what do I want to do with this book? Uh, and the first thing I wanted to do was bring back uh, Aaron and Shoshana from uh, Israel, the, the Mossad assassins. And they, they were, uh, they were one-offs. So, you know, they wrote them in Days of Rage, and I was going to whack them. I mean, I completely, I made them to kill them. That was the only reason they were in the book. And I got through with the book, and I liked them too much. So I just let them kind of ride off into the sunset. Um, you didn't do that, surely, when you were in Special Forces. Just give people a pass if you liked them. No. 
this time that well maybe they're really nice now. So I, I liked them too much and let them I let them go off in the sunset. And then I was riding uh, the Insider Threat, and the team was in Jordan. Pike was running around. And I had to have something. I had to have a character do something. And uh, I could have created somebody out of whole cloth. And I thought, well, oh, you know, that would fit Shoshana. So I plucked her off the shelf and put her in the book. Well, I got a tiny email about how great it was. She was back. Um, and I was like, boy, thank God I didn't kill her. So, yeah, I liked her. So I brought her back a second time in Ghost of War. And, uh, but that was also kind of a coincidence thing that happened. It wasn't planned that way. It just fit. Um, and this time I set out. The first thing I was doing, I went and Shoshana in the book. Two, I wanted to make it personal uh, advice. I did Ring of Fire, which was the ports and Grand Tapestry, Ghost of War, World War III. I wanted to do something really personal that wasn't uh, chasing a headline type thing. And uh, four, I wanted to go somewhere I hadn't been before. And you actually wound up in two places you haven't been before. Well, I've been, I've been running around Israel quite a bit, yeah. but uh, I had never been to South Africa or Lesotho. Which is a country strangely entirely surrounded yeah. by South Africa. I didn't know anything about that. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed <laughs> to say. It looks like Lesotho. The right. tribe is Basotho, and they speak Sesotho, but it's actually pronounced Lesotho, Basotho, and Sesotho, which I learned once I got on the ground there. Um, but yeah, so I started looking at Israel, uh, because it's got to be Aaron Shoshana, there's got to be some kind of tie. So naturally, I started looking at, you know, Palestinian, the Islamic Jihad, and Hamas, and all that kind of stuff. And none of that really was tickling me. I didn't feel like writing about them. Uh, and then I hit on the diamond trade, uh, which is very, very big in Israel. It's very, you know, if you go to New York Diamond District, everybody there is Jewish. Mm -hmm. They have a family in Israel. Diamond Exchange is the biggest one in the world. Uh, Antwerp will compete with them and claim they are, but it's pretty big. Um, and so I started following that upstream, which went to the Kimberlite Mines in uh, Africa. So I started thinking about uh, a coup, doing a coup. Uh, something that would resonate inside Africa, wouldn't make the news in the United States, but it's very realistic. And then I started looking at countries, and Sierra Leone, and all those dumps. I was like, I don't want to go there. Uh, and I found Lesotho, which I never even knew existed. They produce some of the largest skin quality diamonds in the world. And uh, they're completely, it's a microstate, just like Vatican City or uh, um, Monaco. It's just all surrounded by another state inside the city, uh, the center of South Africa. We actually have something similar here, the Hopi Reservation oh, yeah. is within the Navajo Reservation. So it's okay. like, uh-huh. Same type thing. Yeah. yeah, so these guys, uh, and it, their, their evolution is really fascinating. They, they basically, uh, they were fleeing the Zulu Wars and made the Mountain Kingdom. The first guy, uh, Mushushu, the first king there, was really a genius as far as uh, manipulating the British and manipulating the Zulus and everybody else. He had everybody fighting everybody else. And he became a British protectorate, and when South Africa declared independence from Britain, he said, well, I'll do the same. I've got my own country. And there's, it's a really interesting place. Their number one export, uh, number two export is diamond. Their number one export is water. And their water all goes to Johannesburg, uh, which is really bad for the people of uh, Lesotho because they're all drinking out of muddy streams because they have a lot of water and it's funneled right into South Africa. Uh, so when they have a coup and they have unrest, uh, South Africa's rolling in. It's a, they may claim sovereignty. Make no mistake, South Africa, they want their water. And if something's going bad, they had a coup in 1998, things shooting in the streets and everything. South Africa sent a peacekeeping force in that uh, jumped into the dams. And held all the dams and let them all shoot each other up and said, stay away from the dams. So. Well, South Africa is having another terrible drought. So water right. indeed is possibly the scarcest so, resource. Especially in the South, yeah. Right. Um, in South Africa. Well, let's talk a little bit about diamonds. When Rob and I went to South Africa, we rode Robus Rail, which is the old Victorian railway that they have restored. It's, it's a version of the Orient Express mm -hmm. from Pretoria to Cape Town. And they stop at the Kimberley Mine, which, you know, was forever one of the most productive, maybe one of the largest diamond mines in the world. Um, basically, it's a huge hole in the ground. Um, actually, you can achieve the same effect by going over to Marinci over on the yeah. Arizona border. If you look through. at that hole. And, I mean, seriously, it looks, I was amazed because you look down and here are these enormous machines that look like toys, you know, or look like you're seeing them from the airplane or something. Um, but but diamonds are found in very specific locations. Which is, yeah, surprising is because most of them, you know, West Africa's got all the mines, blood diamonds, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Lesotho's, it's it's high. You're at uh, 6,000 feet, 7,000 feet. The whole land is high up in the air. Uh, and the diamond mines are way out in the hinterlands. And De Beers, of course, <coughs> owns the whole place. You know, they don't, nobody in Lesotho's getting rich off the diamonds, which is the genesis of the whole plot of my book. Right. Um, they're all, it's all 
naturally, you know, the, the resources are all be taken by the beers. They basically own them all. Well, some diamonds were like found in, there's a wonderful book called Strangely Enough Diamond by somebody I can't remember, but it had all to do with the geography involved in diamonds um, and volcano, you know, the tubes and so forth that they um, exist in. Well, now they have it. The, uh, they had this huge class I got when I went to Diamond Exchange. The, um, you know, the, the four C's, everybody knows those, cut, clarity, that kind of thing. So the, the pure white diamond is the best thing in the known universe, the most expensive thing ever. And because diamonds are all marketing, uh, somebody said, we're tossing out a lot of blue, red diamonds. You know, we ought to be marketing these things as super special. <laughs> so that's what they do now. Pure white? No, I want the blue one. Which used to be crap. People throw it out. You know, that, that'll become a chainsaw somewhere. <laughs> now they turn into a gym quality diamond because it's blue. Or green. Or green, right. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, it's all to do with the impurities in the crystals, you know. Um, and actually, the cutting is, is a huge part of what makes, which is one of the reasons Israel is such a big center, and Antwerp, and New York City. Because, you know, a diamond is just a, a thing until somebody cuts it and fastens it and polishes it. And, and they have, one of the things I learned there is they're really getting smoked by India. Because it used to be yeah. a high, you know, big uh, trade that you learn forever. Now they have kids in India doing it on the street. <laughs> and they're paying the nickels. It's not near the quality, but it can turn out a lot more diamonds. It's really interesting. And so I people are, when they, they used to send all their stuff to the Israeli exchange to, for them to cut and make this perfect diamond. Uh, well, I can get a slightly less perfect diamond and a heck of a lot cheaper because some kid in India will do it. And what are um, industrial diamonds? Are they kind of the detritus of the diamond trade? They No, actually, they they because they use them just about for everything. They don't make as much money, but it certainly is. It's When you go to the diamond exchange, they've got rough diamonds and what you're talking about, and they've got the polished diamonds. And then the two sides are equal, and they're, they're trading on both sides. So tell us about your adventure when you were in your South African oh, surrounded yeah. country as a researcher. It sounded a so, little scary. Yeah, it was not. I was pretty stupid. The, um, <laughs> so I did my research in, in Jerusalem and um, Tel Aviv and uh, Haifa and went to uh, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and I had to get to Lesotho, which is where I was ending up. And the book's going to be about a coup. So I'd done my research, uh, you know, all about as much as I could about the surrounding countryside. I knew where I needed to go, and Masura is the capital of Lesotho. And there's a bunch of towns, you know, in the country. It's not that big of a country, but basically the towns are just satellites. It's not like the United States. You know, if you took over Washington, D.C., you're not taking over America. I mean, we've still got New York. We've still got Los Angeles. We've still got all these cities. Uh, that's not the case of Lesotho. You take over Masura, and you're, you own the country. Nobody else would even know it happened, you know, until they came into town one day. And they have a history of coups, and so I was going to do a coup. And so I hit the ground and met my guide, my intrepid guide, and told her, yeah, great, the biggest ball of mud, I, I got all these tourist things you want to show me, uh, I don't want to see any of those, here's what I need to see. Uh, and so I had, I you know, used to be special forces, I could do a coup, I planned on how I'd take this country down because I'm going to write about it. So I took pictures of the television station, the main police station, parliament, <laughs> all these places. <laughs> I had a great aerial photo of the airfield, the secret airfield, <laughs> and uh, I went to, I finally found a special forces base, she was taking me to all these military bases, and I'm talking to the guy at the front gate, eliciting information, because the coup's going to be done by their SF, uh, and I got rolled up by a counterintelligence, a bunch of goons rolled me up, threw me in the back of an SUV, and hauled me on the base, <laughs> and uh, threw me into a concrete cell and interrogated me for six and a half hours. Uh, I was an American spy. <laughs> and they hit me right off the bat. And uh, I had nothing to disprove that theory. There was, they, I tried to sterilize myself. I hid my camera. They found the camera. Um, they're looking at the pictures. In the picture, I have a picture of the Prime Minister's residence where there's a sign saying, No pictures! <laughs> and it's from a moving car as we race by it. <laughs> I mean, nothing in my camera looked good. Uh, I couldn't really explain what I was doing there. I'd already told a guy I was retired military at the front gate just to build some rapport. That didn't work out well for me. They were convinced I was a spy. They told me that there was a special forces team on the ground. I was part of that team. That all entered into their book. And I learned a lot about Lesotho politics. Now, I knew in 2014 they had a pseudo-coup, which is what drew me to the country in the first place. Um, the head of the Soso Defense Force, the LDF, is a three-star general. He's been there forever. And he's more and more, he'd gotten more and more powerful where the military owns a monopoly of violence and it was starting to overshadow the police force and all their forms of government. Now they're worried this guy's going to take over. He's going to be a military dictator and take over the country. So the prime minister said, you're done. You need to retire. You've been here long enough. Time for you to move on. Give you a great pension. You leave. 
He said, I'm not leaving. You can't make me. This is in 2014. So the prime minister said, uh, um, well, okay, you can stay as a three-star general, but this new guy is going to be in charge of the LDF. This other three-star, I'm promoting him. He's in charge of the LDF. Well, they found him underneath the bridge of the bulletin's head a week later. And the other general, who's still in charge, then began ironically screaming that, you're out to kill me, you're out to kill me, look, you killed him. And everybody's kind of like, you think we're going to buy that? You're the one that killed him. Well, they claimed it was a coup. So the prime minister and all the members of parliament fled the country. That's what I knew. What I didn't know was uh, that guy finally retired a week before I hit the ground. It's been going on since then. One. Two, he retired because the American embassy started putting some serious pressure. Yeah, we put a lot of aid money into that thing, and it was like, we're going to cut you off completely. So now the, the LDF, which loved him, hates Americans. Three, they all think there's some conspiracy going on, these spies running everywhere. And four, there really was an SF team on the ground. That they, I'm sure, was just doing a security assessment at the embassy. They thought they were out there, you know, they're going to kill everybody or something. I don't know. So that's what I walked right into going, I'm looking at special forces. That's <laughs> who I am. Look at my pictures. Um, you didn't want to tell them that you're a writer and have a no Google way. view and see who you are? No way. And they weren't that good, actually. It all It's in the book. That, everything that Johan does, except for the fact he gets smacked around. They didn't let hand on me. But uh, they they weren't that squared away. They, uh, For instance, I told the guy the night before that I want to find the Air Force Base. It's a secret base. And um, she said, oh, I know exactly where it is. The guy said, can you take me there? She said, sure, we can drive by. So I texted my wife. I only had iMessage. I didn't have cell coverage in Lesotho. She's going to take me to the secret base, um, which was in my phone when they took it. <laughs> so I'm saying, oh my God. But they didn't make me unlock my phone, which is the first thing I've done for anybody. I said, I don't have cell service. And they were like, okay, and you put the phone aside. They didn't look in my journal, which I take everywhere. I've shown the journal before, which I was writing, how do you do a coup in Missouri? You know, I need to go here, here, here. I got to take this out, take that out. Here's how I'm going to destroy this country. Uh, it was all in my journal. They didn't look at that. They didn't use my pocket. I had some incriminating stuff in my pocket. So they were not as squared away as they could have been. Uh, they tried to be. I could tell they'd been trained. Uh, they could tell I'd been trained. They accused me of being trained. I'm like, how am I supposed to answer that? <laughs> and they start crying. I could do that. <laughs> so it uh, went around and around and around. They finally gave me, um, a, the commander came in. I assume it was commander. They were all in civilian clothes. But everybody jumped to attention when he came in the room. Uh, and he gave me a big speech. Uh, about uh, relationships with America and what he blah 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 just went on and on and on and I realized he really does think I'm a spy he's about to let me go and he thinks I'm gonna go back to the ambassador and relay this piece of diplomacy to the ambassador uh, said I went back to my hotel and pushed a dresser in front of the door and <laughs> told my wife what happened um, and so that's that's basically what happened <laughs> Impeccable timing is always yes. there. <laughs> well, the end of the story is we did, I, I still did my research the next day. Um, and I got on the little puddle jumper to fly home. And it's a, it's, a, it's a real small plane with like one seat on one side, two on the other. You know, there's nowhere, you're not hiding from anybody coming on the plane. And there's no gates or terminals. It's, you know, it's out there in the middle of an airfield. And uh, I sat down to fly back to Johannesburg. And um, the head interrogator got on, got on the plane. And I'm like, you got a kid. <laughs> and I thought, is he going to pull me off the plane? Is this really what's going on here? Because um, then I was going to start screaming for the embassy, right off the bat. You don't have me on a military base. I've got my passport back. You can't touch me. And he came on the plane. He was carrying a little bag. And he went. <laughs> and he saw me sitting there. And I was like, oh, he didn't know I'm on his plane. <laughs> and he's doing something wrong. I can tell by the way he's looking at me. <laughs> so I thought, oh. Did you chat all the way to Johannesburg? No, he walked by me and acted like he didn't know me at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I thought I'd make some trouble for him. But I didn't. I got to play around. <laughs> you could have written a totally different book after you had this experience. Yeah, well, all of it's in the book. I mean, when Johan gets interrogated, every, every bit of that ended up being in the book. In fact, the entire plot line was driven by all the, what I learned in that interrogation. The uh, SF team factors heavily in the book. The uh, Johan learns all kinds of stuff that I learned. The concrete cell with the cloth sheet. Everything he saw, all those characters, the frog is real. He's the one that got on the plane with me. In the book, I get the whacking. Um, but uh, all that happened. Except he got, you know, it's literally licensed. So he got smacked around. Johan did. They didn't, they didn't touch me. And, I, you know, I... I I was worried. I wasn't worried at first until they really started digging in the camera. And I realized I had no plausible reason to do any of this stuff. Uh, oh, my tour guide lied to me. She said we're going to Marija, which is the uh, 
cultural center of uh, Lesotho, which factors in the book as well. Uh, and there's, and she said, on the way, we'll stop and look at this place, which is, we did, except we never made it any further because I got rolled up. Uh, and so I said, we were just on the way to Marija. And the guy says, this isn't the way to Marija. How do you answer that? It's not? <laughs> uh, I was told it was. Liar! Now you're lying again. It's like, you know, show me a map. I was told that's the way to go to Marija. I didn't know how to answer that question. My passport, I was, I was, they proved I was a spy because uh, I was born in Okinawa, Japan. <laughs> so my passport says, born in Okinawa, Japan. See, it's not even a real passport. <laughs> you were born in Okinawa, Japan. I was like, really? Yeah, don't you think if I was a true spy, they'd give me a passport that didn't look stupid? <laughs> and a cell phone that worked? So I had a lot working on my, you know, logically. But I had nothing working as far as... Maybe they thought I saw just a double bluff. So I, I, was, I was petrified they were going to Google me. They were really paranoid. And if they had Google me, that was, that was getting locked up. Uh, and I also thought, my God, I was going to throw me under the bus. Because she could certainly prove who she was. I am a tour guide. As a matter of fact, he was doing some strange stuff. <laughs> I think you're right. He is a spy. Can I go now? <laughs> Are all your research trips this exciting? This has been about the most exciting. But I've had some other exciting ones. In Tepito Barrio in Mexico City was another one. Which really? I shouldn't have... What happened there? We almost got killed, basically. Uh, I wanted to go to Tepito because they had... Uh, uh, <laughs> she didn't make this trip either. Uh, I went to... I wanted to see Tepito, which is where you can buy drugs and guns and, and all kinds of stuff. Hand grenades, you name it. And it's it's a real rough barrio just north of Zacalo in Mexico City. Uh, so much so the taxis don't go there. Nobody goes there. It's known as the bad area. Um, and I wanted to go see it because obviously it's known as the bad area. That's where the my bad guys are going to be. And I had a buddy of mine, a Navy SEAL, working in the embassy. And I said, I want to go to Tepito, and obviously the embassy says, don't go there, it's off limits. Nobody goes there. You can't go there. If you go there, you're on your own. And I said, is it true? If, can I, is it really that bad, or can I go there? Uh, if I just did a quick trip through there, would that be okay? And he said, right, let me get you hooked up with an expert. And he had this guy who's from Texas, but had spent the last 32 years as a reporter in Mexico City. Speaks fluent Spanish. He knows my background. We get into a first mistake, get an unregistered cab, because regular cabs don't go there. The embassy says, don't ever get an unregistered cab. So we get an unregistered cab. And we get in the heart of Tepito, which is about as narrow, the street's about as narrow as these chairs, and it's just a swarming mass of people. And they all start beating on the hood. They see gringos in the back. The driver shouts something in Spanish. I say, what did he say? He said, lock the doors. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so we lock the doors. We do about a foot and every inch. I have a camera I'm afraid to even lift it up. I'm just sitting there not looking at anybody because I don't want anybody to look at me and then get mad and smash the windows. Uh, and they banged, I mean, all the way through. We finally hit the street and get out. And I was like, holy moly. That's the polite way of saying what I said. <laughs> that was rough. I mean, I've been in Fallujah. I've been in Ramadi. I've been driving in Ramadi in a Toyota pickup truck by myself. So, I mean, I've been in some rough areas. And I said, that's, I was pretty scared. And the uh, guy said, uh, the reporter said, yeah, thank God you were with me. <laughs> Are you insane? Would you not have come here if it wasn't for me? He said, no, there's no way I'd go to Tepito. I only go because they said you were, you know, part of Special Forces. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, that was another stupid thing I did. You probably thought you were like a Marvel comic hero exactly. that could rise to all occasions. And do so, something. we went and had a margarita after and laughed about it, but I said, that's, that's a bad mistake if someone says you do go to Tepito for somebody like me. No. <laughs> So you created this fictional world in which may kill you or get you killed. Um, tell us a little bit about about the task force. Why did you design it the way that it is? Because I mean, you could have done anything yeah. since you made up this whole universe. Right. Yeah. And actually, that came about for um, two primary reasons. Uh, number one, we used to kind of fantasize about it when I was in the military. Um, People think that we have a unit like the task force, we don't. And they think it's just super easy to go zipping somewhere to smoke a bad guy, and it's damn near impossible. Um, people ask me, if you really, you know, if you wrote a real story, what would it be like? It would be just as big as this book, except it would be 800 pages of PowerPoint presentations and arguing with lawyers, and then two pages <laughs> at the very end. And in between all that would be a bunch of canceled missions that you never got to do. Uh, it's very, very hard to work the inertia inside the... Um, uh, bureaucracy of the United States government, because there's always somebody who has a reason why it shouldn't happen. I mean, the only one, the Osama bin Laden is the only one that you would, yep, you can go. Anybody else, Abu bag of donuts, here's all the bad thing he's done. Uh, he's now in Nigeria, ambassador from Nigeria will tell you this is a bad time, the crop circles are this, and you're going to cause issues with that, and no, 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 he's not doing anything wrong here. Don't do it, I don't want to upset the apple cart. And you're not going anywhere. So that was one part of it was we used to fantasize. Wouldn't it be neat if you had a force that nobody could say no to and had just small oversight and they could launch? 
Uh, and the other reason was I, most of what I did in the military was classified, and I didn't want anybody to accuse me of writing about uh, changing the names to protect the innocent, writing about a real unit. Um, anybody, that, if you read my books and you know what goes on in the world, you absolutely know there's no such thing as what I'm writing about, so I couldn't possibly be writing about something real because it doesn't exist. Okay. You know, anything like that. So what is the task force? So you defined it in this particular thing, or somebody <coughs> did, is an elite off-the-book task force that answers only to the president and a small oversight committee. Yeah, that's true. So when I designed it... Just at the moment, that's a truly terrifying thought. Okay. Yeah. Answers only to the president. Well, My heart <laughs> stopped. Actually, answers to that. the oversight council. I don't know why I said that's not exactly true. There's an oversight council. When I actually designed it, I thought there would be checks and balances. And okay. it's built... I have a charter written of what this guy, what they're allowed to do. They're not allowed to operate in the U.S. soil. They all these restrictions they can't do as far as listening to the Americans. And you can't, they, they can't target American citizens. They can't... There's all these things oh, you have to do. that's like Britain. That's like the difference between MI5 and MI6. Well, this is a difference. Is the, um, I may have, uh, and I kind of hate the way I, you know, once you make something, then you got to stick with it and like ever. Uh, so we have what's known as the uh, um, terrorism list, the foreign terrorist organization list, which is put out by the State Department. If you're an FTO and you're on the list, you're an organization that's registered as a foreign terrorist organization by the United States government. And there's bazillions of them. You don't, most people don't know who they are. But I mean, if you're not on that list and you're not targetable, you can't be targeted. So I had all these restrictions of what they could and couldn't do. And then I had the Oversight Council created, which was 13 individuals that would, as a body, have to decide whether they could give them permission to do operations. And operations start from um, Alpha to Omega. Alpha being just, we're developing a target. And they don't get Omega authority until they've proven that it's uh, clear and present danger to the United States, and they can, they'll give them authority to take the guy out. So I put a lot of thought into how it was going to work. Then I started breaking all those rules left and right. Start right off on this book. But they talk about breaking the rules, and they know it's a rule break. Did you ever get to speak to Vince Flynn? I did not. I, well, I did over email. That's okay. it. Okay. Because he um, had, you know, he created his own. That, right, the Orion team. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, he uh, he was real, real kind to me. And so I sent him an email thanking him, and he sent a nice email back to me, and then he passed away. He was a lovely guy. I still remember Vince coming in to the back of the bookstore when that was the back of the bookstore. This guy came in out of a car and he had a bag of books with him because he self-published his first book. Right. And he came in to pitch me about whether I'd like to carry it here in the store, despite the fact that it was self-published. Who knew? Um, how would all go? But, you know, fortunately I said okay. And, you the know, good. we had a real romance right up to the bitter end. I know, he was a lovely guy. But yeah, I did, real kind. Um, he did, um, towards the end of his life, was actually consulted by people in government about some of his ideas. I think that might be true of some of the other military fiction writers. Does that happen to you at all? <laughs> if you mean consulted, being interrogated by CID. <laughs> no, I meant in a positive way. I said, tell us how to do this. That's many positive coming out of my experience. Uh, because I know what I know, when uh, No Easy Day came out, um, which is the SEAL book, nonfiction. Right. Um, so come lost her mind. And if you wrote a gardening book, you were getting raked over the coals. And I got raked over the coals for about a year. Uh, right. I got cleared, you know, at the end of the day, they were like, you're good, but it was not pleasant at all. So I thought during this whole year that you had for the first time, I mean, it's been, it was last January that you were here. Usually it's June and July and right. I had us back again. I thought you were going to have this terrific time off, and instead, what did you do? You had knee surgery. Yeah. That <laughs> I just sympathize. happened. See, you got a knee, knee, right? Left knee is a lot bigger than my right one, and it, it's still killing me. So, jury's right. out on whether it's worth it or not. We'll see. Well, I can tell you, because my left knee is also a steel knee, that it really is, but it takes about a year. Yeah. Right now I'm cursing my doctor and everybody told me to do it. No, 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 no. You'll be glad that you did it. Honestly. Hopefully. It's harder. Some people have an easy time and some people, <coughs> excuse me, don't. But um, I, I hated it for like four months. And yeah. now now I love it. I'm at two months mark right now. Oh, it's not been long enough. You'll like it. Believe me. I don't like it on the airplanes right now. I want to tell my publisher, I need to fly first class. I need more room. I can't do 90 degrees on my knee. Yeah. Which I hadn't thought about. Yeah. All right, so final question. Um, who is it that you read when you're not writing, assuming that, like, when you're recovering from knee surgery, you might be I, reading? I read uh, uh, murder mysteries. I used to read I used to read Vince Flynn when I was in the infantry, uh, and I first got into Special Forces on Okinawa. I would read in my own genre. 
uh, once I got to a special mission unit and I really started doing missions, uh, especially after 9-11, I mean, you don't want to read what you do. Uh, I quit reading my genre. I'm sure doctors don't read their you know, medical thrillers either. Uh, so I didn't, I don't like reading. I'm, reading's escape. You want to escape from your world, not, oh, look what this guy got to do in the fiction world. You know, I'm still briefing the chief of stage and you won't let me do anything. Um, and so I started reading murder mysteries, and that's what I read now. I just, I just read Michael Connolly's latest book, and I'm in fact now reading uh, Robert Crace's book, which just came out. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn off our podcast and thank those people who are going to listen to it in advance. Let's see if I can do that. Yay. I'm always so excited when it works. <laughs> oh, and um, I thought that Brad might like to take questions at this point. Miles, are we doing this on Facebook? Oh, well then, in that case, let me also thank our Facebook audience for joining us and watching it. And feel free to share it with your at your Facebook page and with all of your friends. And you can do it on yours, too. Right. Lorraine, do you know how to do that? I do. Excellent. And he's in charge of She's, I thought she might be. She's kind of the intelligence operation. Exactly. Right? The person who doesn't go into the slums. <laughs> so, any of you have questions that you would like to ask, Brent? Yes, ma'am. When they were looking at your camera and the incriminating pictures, did they either erase them or, or confiscate no. the camera? They gave it back. They gave me the camera back. And also, the one thing that I, I thought I'm really in trouble now was the overhead shot. We, I, she took me to the top of a mountain where I could see down the city, and I got the airfield. Uh, the secret air base, and I took that picture. Um, and I thought for sure, they, they skipped right over that picture. Just, I guess it just looked like the city. When I, I saw them looking at that picture, I thought, oh no, there's the secret air base no one's supposed to know about. Uh, they skipped right over it. So they asked a lot of weird questions. The, the Japanese thing, we were around around about that, which is fine. If you're in interrogation, they want to argue something that you know is real, like the fact that my passport's real. I'll talk about that all day long. Don't go back to the pictures. Well, that was the ultimate research that you did. Yeah, it worked being out. In it, being I usually out. say that there's, when I go overseas to do the research, there's 50% I'm looking for, and 50% is looking for me, and I don't even know what it is. In this case, it ended up being about 10% to 90, because it smacked me in the head with a baseball bat. Yes, ma'am. Did you grow up as um, a kid who just liked adventure and always, when somebody said, don't do that, you had to do it? I don't know if I, they said don't do that, you had to do it. I do know I got in a lot of trouble. Because uh, as you were telling that story, you're reminding me of my son. So I just Yeah, we used to do things. There's a lot of things I did as a kid. I'm like, I cannot believe I'm not in jail. Um, I got in a lot of trouble. And I got a lot of support from my parents. We wrecked four police cars one time, and we got away. Nobody caught us, but the police figured out who it was and came to our house and uh, braced us. And... Um, yeah, we just said, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, we didn't do it. And my dad, he couldn't prove it either. And they left, and my dad said, you know, if they proved that you did this, I'm not going to protect you. And I could see him kind of smiling about, you know, we wrecked four police cars and nobody caught us. So, yeah, we used to do things that weren't, we used to get in trouble. It's all harmless fun, though. <laughs> Anybody else? So in your, uh, did you, like, on the fly come up with like a, a cover story or when they were asking you like you know why are you here why you get these pictures are you like i the, or, or i came you up just with try to steer the conversation into mine was i'm a tourist i came here to visit your country why are you treating me this way okay i'm an american i can't to, and the i was with a tour guide a registered tour guide and she was she ended up being a spitfire i thought she was gonna throw me under the bus just before we got separated she said don't say anything about writing a book and i was like roger that I hadn't intended to which now i knew she wasn't gonna say anything about writing a book and um she had all the credentials of being a tour guide. I was just a tourist. Yeah, and uh, that's, but you know, you couldn't explain the pictures, which you right. just played dumb. Well, I just wanted to see Parliament. I was, uh, you know, visit this, visit that. I'm coming to a military base because I used to be in the military. I do it every country I go to, which is actually kind of true. Uh, I don't tell them it's a book I'm researching, but I usually go to a military base or at least military museum or something like that because I'm interested in that. Uh, and I just went round and round and stuck to my story, stuck to my story. They can't knock me off my story. You can't, you can't disprove what I'm saying. Yeah, everything you've got stacked up in front of you looks pretty bad, but you still can't disprove that I'm in fact a tourist. You know, and I have no contact. One thing that helped me out, I had not been to the embassy yet, and uh, so I couldn't even describe what it looked like. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know the ambassador's name was. Uh, and I wasn't lying about that. So that kind of helped me. I think if I had been to the embassy, uh, it really would have buried me. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time there, 
I mean, what you should do if you're ever incarcerated overseas, the first thing you need to say is, I want to see my embassy. I want to see somebody from the consulate, somebody from the embassy, right now. I realized early on they hated the embassy, so I didn't say that. Um, I figured I'll talk my way out of this. And it got to be about the six hour mark where I thought, I think they're gonna lock me up. Uh, and so I said, okay, well, I wanna see the embassy. That's my next thing I'm gonna say. Mm -hmm. And I saw the tour guide get let out of her isolation facility, and I saw she had my passport in her hand. And I thought, well, let me go. Yeah, she, they wouldn't go to the passport, I don't let me go. So they, they, I wrote down all this stuff on a piece of paper, and I had a picture taken. <laughs> With a digital camera they brought in, I don't know where that thing is, but I wish I had the courage to say, can I get a copy of that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that thing would be really cool to have. <laughs> the ultimate author photo. Exactly. <laughs> I would love to see that picture. Uh, I don't know what they did with it. It's in some file somewhere. But no, I just stuck to my story. I wasn't going to try to make up anything because I could not compete with her. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're ever in interrogation, there's two of you, that's, that's what they're going to do. They're going to question you, and then they're going to question you. And what you say that doesn't match up with what she says, they're going to go back to her. He said this. You say something, he said this. I know it's really easy to crack somebody that way. So I just stuck with the basic, I'm a tourist, she's my tour guide. And I just prayed that she wasn't saying something stupid. It turned out she went to high school with a minister of uh, tourism. And she had texted before they stole her cell phone, call the U.S. Embassy if we're not out here by 7, and, uh, which is really switched on. And it turned out she was really embarrassed that this had happened. She blamed herself, and I'm going to give her a bad trip advisor review. And, <laughs> and I was like, it's my fault. I'm the one that told you to do this. And she said, I'm afraid of telling my boss, you know. And I said, well, don't tell him. She said, well, I have to say something. I mean, you got to interrogate for six hours in a military prison where they shoot people. I said, I'm not going to say anything. You don't say anything, I won't say anything. And she was completely, oh, you're the best ever. <laughs> so that worked out. But she, she ended up being a real spitfire. And I was actually petrified she was going, that they called the embassy, because that would be another nut roll. If they had Googled my bio, they would have thought I was doing something secret. Because I've worked for the embassy. They'd have thought it was some secret mission. Right. They'd have probably beat up the SF team that was on there. Luckily, she didn't call. We got out before she called. So that worked out. If you had said she can write her, then what would they... She had some concern about being a writer for whatever reason. I don't know what it was. My concern was they'd look at my bio and that would be it. They accused me of being a special forces spy. And now, hey, look, Brad Taylor used to be in special forces, and that had been, yeah, they were really convinced I was a spy. And it was all a big front. I mean, they were real paranoid. It was. Say it wasn't the writing part; it was the bio part. Oh yeah, yeah, it was the bio. They Google my bio. They would Google what I write about Google bio, and they would think it was all fake, and then I was actually I was sent here by the CIA. To spy on so to, to assassinate somebody. Actually, there's at least two thrillers I can think of, and actually I can't recall the title of either one, that begin um, with exactly what happened to Brad, where, you know, somebody is taking pictures they shouldn't be taking or something in a country, and, you know, they're rolled up and off they go. Uh, it, it actually has been a premise. Well, mine wasn't, I didn't set out that way. <laughs> I kind of stumbled upon my premise. Do, you, that, uh, do we even want to know what your next book is going to be about and where you're yeah, likely to go? I, we've already done the uh, research trip, <clears throat> and right before I had my Titanic knee replaced. Um, we went to um, France, Switzerland, and uh, Monte Carlo. <laughs> oh, I, changed <laughs> I didn't get ruled up there. <laughs> you sure? Yeah, Not we went all over casino? that place. <laughs> we went to the casino, which I was completely underwhelmed, but I can't wait to write that scene. Boy, it's James Bond very, movies make it look a heck of a lot better. <laughs> it's very small and kind of shabby. I went to Europe with my grandmother when I was 15 years old. It was 1955, and Europe was still pretty beat up, um, and much of it was very shabby, and I was determined to see the inside of the casino, but you had to be 21, so I went up to Trevor with a scarf, you know, and all kinds of things. I looked like some kind of secret agent <laughs> smuggled into the casino. I wouldn't have had any idea how to play any of the games. I mean, you know, 20, whatever, I would have been hopeless, and it's too elegant for slots, so, you know, I would have been completely exposed if I tried to gamble, but I, was, I, was I remember how disappointed yeah. I was. Shabby's know? are probably the best way to Yeah, describe. and tiny. Yeah. You know, you Hollywood movies. Remember To Catch a Thief? Yeah. Who yeah. could forget Monica. To Catch a Thief? Royale. Oh, the right. Monica, and I was like, it makes it look huge. Monica and it's just... itself is pretty. Well, it wasn't in 1955. <laughs> <laughs> All of Europe was really 
sad and dingy. It was so. It was only nine, you know, nine years but after the war. Really. That's true, sir. It was a. It was a very. That was my first experience. I've been back lots of times since. But it's, it's hard to explain just how any of you read things said in post-war England, you know, and you're surprised by how long rationing went on. Yes. I mean, it went on for years after yeah, the war and so right. forth. We think, oh, the war was over and everything went back to normal. It didn't really work out that way. Mm -hmm. And much of it was flattened. I mean, if you go to Hamburg today, it's this terrific, vibrant, um, you know, very modern city and so forth. It was just flattened. So if you'd gone there when I went there, there wasn't actually much of Hamburg <coughs> to see or the east end of London was, you know, and flattened and now it's full of you know canary wharf and all kinds of stuff but not then so i, I thought my car was very pretty though yeah it is now and it's a beautiful yeah. harbor right yeah, and, uh, incredible clean. amounts of money their aquarium's not nearly as, they, we like the aquarium but they, they were saying it's the best aquarium in the world i'm like really? <laughs> <laughs> i used to live in monterey which has yes. the best aquarium in the world <laughs> right breaking, breaking. question over yes, there. Sir. Oh, sorry. Is there a question over there? Yeah, we well, to speed up from 1940 to today, okay. I noticed that, um, like on Twitter, that's how I found you as an author. And I want to know how social media informs what you do now, as opposed to before Twitter and all that good stuff. How it informs my, like my researcher? Um, like no, the way you communicate with your fans besides book signings and the way that you... Uh, the way you hear from fans as opposed to people yeah. coming to a book I, I the I guess for me it hasn't it hasn't changed anything because I became an author so late that social media was, existed. I walked into social media, although it was very strange for me because when I was in the military in classified organizations I didn't have social media. I still don't have a Facebook page. Uh, I have an author's page, which is at, and my admin is my wife. <laughs> it's off her Facebook page. I don't have a personal Facebook page, I, and, and I created a Twitter account. Um, and I do use it, I don't use it as much as some. Some people really go crazy on Twitter. Um, and I find it's really hard to keep up. You know, you'll check Twitter and then it's like, holy moly, i got to answer this, answer that. Next thing you know, you're answering a thousand people. And um, sometimes you get some... Guilty. I had thought I'd you answer replied. Jimmy Gay. I you did. You replied twice. So yes. I had to show up. <laughs> I was actually in the car coming back from Sun City when that happened. <laughs> Sun City West. We were here on the ground. The... Uh, so I really do try. I answer every email that's sent to me. If somebody Facebook messages me, I'll answer that. Twitter, I'll answer that if there's a, a reason to answer. Um, sometimes I just like it if they say I really loved your book or something like that. But uh, it gets hard to keep up with. We have an Instagram account too, and it gets to the point where it's like, uh, how much of this stuff do I have to do? That uh, I really enjoy doing it with the fans. The interacting with the fans is the reason I do it. I, don't, I certainly don't do it. And this is just me. I'm probably a dinosaur. But I don't see the juice is worth a squeeze as far as selling books. I don't think that, you know, uh, guys that have 42,000 Twitter followers, they don't sell as many books as I do. And I have 2,000. You know, and I don't go out of my way. I use TrueTwit validation, um, which I was told by a bazillion people, don't do it because you won't get followers. And TrueTwit validation basically proves you're a human. Mm -hmm. Before I got it, I was getting a bunch of porn bots and all this weirdo stuff. <laughs> So yeah, I was getting followers, but they were all, you know, breast pictures and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did true, tit, true twit validation so that... Um, Your wife wasn't happy with that, right? <laughs> yeah. I did that just because I didn't want all that trash in there. I don't need the Russian bots or whatever, you know, coming into my Twitter feed. And I was told, that's not good for marketing, you want more followers. And I'm, my answer is, I don't, I don't want more followers. If you're too lazy to quick through a thing, then don't follow me. Doesn't matter to me. Uh, and I'm not really sure... I could be wrong. I mean, I'd love to see some studies. I'm not sure how much of the interaction on social media sells a single copy of any book. I don't know if it does or not. So. <laughs> I, except for one. <laughs> one time. <laughs> well, I think maybe because we share them uh, with our friends. Right. Especially, the, um, I think I use Facebook more than I use Twitter. Yeah, no, I completely, I mean, the best way to sell a book is word of mouth and right. social media is precisely that right. it is word of mouth amongst your friends I'm talking from the, the base station so to speak yeah, I can stand up here and say buy my book <laughs> yeah. that's not nearly as effective as you loving the book and telling your friends right. either through social media Twitter whatever face to face that's certainly because when you were here last year and I did that thing that said I was here and I had 
four of my friends ask me what you wrote. Yeah. So I mean, I definitely yeah. agree with that. I'm speaking more from the from the author's yeah. perspective. Not. I certainly think it's revolutionized the way of um, uh, communicating <laughs> with fans themselves amongst mm -hmm. uh, social media accounts. There's a guy called the Real Book Spy. Who's, yeah. Uh, um, he's really the very good. person I've been quoting all evening long. Yeah, see, he's really yeah. good on social media and everything else, and so I love him to death. You know, I'll do anything. You know, if he wants to do an interview, but he's got to be doing that twenty four seven. Though. Right. Well, he first started. He was. Uh, um, I was there at the very beginning. He was just doing uh, Facebook. He was just kind of dabbling in it as a fan. He was a big Vince Flynn fan. Such a big Vince Flynn fan. He named his kids after all their characters. <laughs> um, and so uh, he, uh, in fact, his handle is. Mitch Rapp or something. Ryan the Rapologist. Ryan the Rapologist. Um, his name's Ryan Steck. He's a great guy. And so he said he was going to start, he's going to try to do this website as an actual functioning business type thing. And what did I help? And I was like, sure, whatever you want. You know, so anytime he asks for an interview, anytime he asks for anything, I'll do what he wants. He's, he's asked if I could do a radio you know, or a, a telephonic interview for a podcast. He's going to start doing that. And I said, sure, I've got all this going on. I got a security contract in April. After April, why don't you hit me back up again? So. I think that's, that stuff really works. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm just lazy and don't like social media. Tell me something about your the si site thing, social security. Uh, it's security. separate from my writing. I just I have a unique skill set, and so people hire me. What kind of people? Doing what? All kinds of people. <laughs> <laughs> military, uh, government. 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 Um, yeah, some military, some not military, but it's not. It's not private. It's, uh, no, I, don't, I mean, I work for a private. I'm self-employed as an independent contractor. Uh, I mean, I'm not getting, you know, putting my rank back on. That's not a big part of your life. Not anymore. It used to be. I had to, you know, I still had to feed the kids. When I was a man, I wasn't making any money off writing. Uh, so I used to do a ton of it. Um, but now I do about three a year. In fact, I just got a text from a buddy of mine. I'm supposed to be on one right now. I said, too bad I got a book coming out. <laughs> so they're out there working. He's cursing me because he's doing double work. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I got a question for your wife. Sure. <laughs> so That's a first. So how is he as a patient, really? Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. He's actually been way better than I thought he would be. Oh, okay. She just sh I had a cold last week. <laughs> and she showed me this video. The, have you seen the video of the man with the flu? The man flu? Yeah. So apparently he's dying, and the wife said, I had it last week, i got to do this. And so she showed me. I was like, okay. <laughs> I had the cold the week before him, and then when he got it, it was <laughs> it was bad. All, he hit everything on the man to the video. <laughs> <laughs> he really it is. It is. Really it works. Yeah. 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 Seems to be striking a chord right across the <laughs> <laughs> So there we are. Right. Anyone else have a question? So you're. I got one. Yes, sir. I'm sure you've been asked many, many times. Is Pike your. Ultra ego? No, I, yeah, I know where you're going with that. I have been asked that many times, and it's yeah. not. He's an amalgamation of people I served with, right. and uh, what I usually say is the. Uh, um, I mean, it's very hard to get the level I was at. It's there's not many people who reach that level, yeah. but there's probably one percent of the world to play on the PGA tour. If you asked uh, the average person who's hundredth on the money list, they'd say I have no idea. Yeah. You ask them who Tiger Woods is, they know that. Well, Pike Logan's Tiger Woods, and I'm kind of hundredth on the money list. I mean, I'm playing the PGA Tour, but nobody knows who I am. <laughs> He's certainly not me. There was a question over here. Uh, I was going to ask, one, you were talking about how many books you sell. Is that classified information, or I'm just curious how many, how big the print runs tend to be? Or? Oh, no, it's not classified, and I honestly don't know. Oh. <laughs> well, it's well, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I know I do, but I'm not telling. Okay. I know, overarchingly, I'm the three million or something. I think he's about to two million for two million. all the books. I, but I don't, you know, for me, it didn't, uh, I wouldn't even have any concept, because I, I came from the military and started writing, I wouldn't even have any concept of what was good or what was bad. So if my publisher was happy, he could have come in and said, you sold five books, woo, and everybody's doing cheetah flips, I'd have been, all right, I'm a success. Or he could have said, oh man, 200,000 books, you're, you're done for. I mean, I don't know what's good. And so I never even chased numbers at all, period. Never it asked. changes all the time, too. Yeah, so. I never asked a single, I've never once oh, yes. asked how many books have I sold. Um, Publishers will sometimes advertise, but the thing is, they print to demand now because reprinting is so quick. 
So what they're really saying is we're willing to go this high, but it doesn't mean that's what they printed to. There's a lot of pressure on us to order books farther and farther in advance, or then they won't include our order when they mm -hmm. when they start to print. So I'm currently booking June. Do I care? Um, but I have to care. Um, and July, and I have to put those orders in now <coughs> when I book them in order for us to have books. I ordered Brad's book like seven months ago. And see, that used to kill me when I was doing two books a year. Right. I would literally finish a book, I mean type the end, and it would be, I need a name, a title, cover, and right. plot for your next book because it's going to be going out to the Poison Pen for a <coughs> Wow. I mean, right it didn't used to be that way. It all went south um, originally with Barnes and Noble and Borders and now Amazon because they do buying seasons. You know how clothes are? You can't ever buy clothes for now. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you go into the store, you know, it's like July clothes now or they're just doing the clearance sale or something. And because they buy so far ahead and do all this stuff, it has kept pushing publishing and book selling further and further out. And I, every once in a while, I get so aggravated. I have ARCs in my office, advanced reading copies for August. Yep. This is January. I can yep. barely cope with January. And I, I keep thinking, I want to say to all these people, just don't send them to me now. It's too depressing. You know, and I look at these stacks and I think, I'll never get through them. You know, what am I going to do? But it's just getting worse in that respect. So the pressure on you and the pressure yeah. on us. But this actually was much more fun 28 years ago. We used to be surprised. You know, books would ship into the store, and we'd open the cart, and we'd go, oh, look, it's a new so-and-so. And, -so. and <laughs> that whole element of happy surprise is completely gone. You know, we have people who order books that are not even written yet. Fans, like this lady over here, a fan of Brad Taylor. You might send us an order and say, I want, you know, Brad Taylor number 13. I mean, we get orders like that right now, you know, we're going, seriously? <laughs> we don't even know what it's called. <laughs> so we have, like, untitled Brad Taylor 2019, the same thing that would exist in our inventory system, so we can write that down. I mean, it's just... Trust me, I'm getting crushed for a title. Every, everybody <laughs> is just, you know, and, and I really miss the days when there was more surprise. I, I, you know, it's, um, it's just a different way of of doing yeah. things now that's been driven by lots of lots of things. But how much fun we can all be here tonight with Brad on his opening night. And we can all be surprised by the story, right? Because you wouldn't have known that he'd been almost arrested, <laughs> <laughs> incarcerated, tortured, but not actually killed <laughs> in the military prison while doing research. You know, that's really a great story. Yeah. Who knew? A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, along a related note, and more maybe per personal, how, how do you feel, do you know the success rate, you know, when you wrote your first book, you know, you had no idea, mm -hmm. sold obviously a few copies, and they said, hey, write another one. Can you log your success from your first book to the 12th book? Do you, do you get a sense of that? or? Yeah, the, each one has, has sold more than the one before. Okay. I know that for a fact. Um, the pre-sales for this book are 30% higher than pre-sales were for Ring of Fire. Uh, and I've been extremely lucky. Uh, every single one of my books, I'm probably going to jinx it right now, um, has hit the New York Times list from the first to the last one I've written. They all have. And that's uh, kind of a double function of when I first started writing, the list went out to 30 places and I made it, and then they cut it to 15, and then I had a big enough audience that I made the 15 cut. But uh, luckily, they've all. Everyone hit, they've hit the list. They've all sold more than the one before. So. Which is your very role this evening. Because yes. that that is being that's why he's here is so I can count how many books you bought and I can report them next Monday to the New York Times. <laughs> that really is how it works, right? And I think on that note, perhaps we should. Wait, I'm sorry. Did you you, you look twitching? Yeah, I was you got curious, one more question. Yeah, I was curious on your choice of weapons. <laughs> what what is it that you see that you want to include with weapons? Because if I'm re remembering correctly, you've switched a lot of weapons to 300 blackout caliber, yeah. and you know I I applaud that choice because it's a great choice. But what is it that moved you from what everybody else used to like 300 blackout? Or well, originally uh, I didn't want to duplicate anything that I've done real world, mm -hmm. so they were running around with HK UMPs, which shoots a 45, which is subsonic round that they can suppress really easily and it matches with their pistols they had and all that. Made sense. 
But that weapon system is not good for anything other than clearing a room. That's basically right. it. If you get in a gunfight anywhere outside of a room, then you um, have issues. Uh, and I had a couple of scenes where they had a couple of HK 416s providing suppressive fire, and everybody else had the HK, and it was getting kind of a mess. And, and then I wanted to buy a 300 Blackout. And so, <laughs> research. I uh, did some research and built myself a 300 Blackout. Right, okay. And uh, that's so I swapped them over in that. Glock, same way. I had. Uh, um, uh, I had just built a custom Glock. From, it's in this book. They've changed it. This custom Glock. Z Tech makes a really nice Glock system. And he built one for me. So I put it in the book. <laughs> now they're using that. Uh, but there's been a lot of. Uh, um, the problem you have in the military, there's been a lot of research on what caliber weapon system we should be using for various things. Uh, from 7.62 all the way down to the 5.56. The problem is it's a NATO round. Uh, we agreed to NATO. Everybody in NATO shoots the same round so I can pick up his ammo and use it in my weapon system. The problem is the rounds aren't that good anymore. Uh, 6.5 Creedmoor, which is also in the book, which I also built one of those, research again. <laughs> um, that is a much better round for knockdown power, wind shear, everything. And um, 300 Blackout's a better round for instead of 5.56. Five, There's all these better rounds that are out there that are getting more and more. In fact, one of them is 260 wind out now. There's a lot of them that are really nice rounds. And the military's looking at them, but they've got a problem. They, you know, you can't outfit. I can't have one unit with a 300 blackout and everybody else shooting 5.56. The, the logistics train just doesn't work that way. And so that's where their issue is. Luckily, money's no object for the task force. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever I want to, and they get to shoot whatever they want. The proving is fiction. The good news is that if you're reading Branch, you know that the gun stuff is correct. Because that's something that trips up an awful lot of authors, but we have an expert here. So, tell you what, Guy, would you like to sign off by taking a ceremonial bite of your cake? Sure, I would. I'm having a hard time not just going, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you all very much. Now, we do have, as I said, we have a giveaway.